Welcome back. This is Hockey Primetime on NHL Network Radio, streaming live at HockeyPrimetime.com. I am Connor McKenna, your host in Philadelphia for the NHL Entry Draft. The second day wrapped up today. We had a great time. Joining me right now are two people who were present for that very event. To my left, Harrison Mooney. Hi there. Further to my left, Sarah Baker. Hi, Connor. Sarah Baker is with Comcast Sportsnet Philly. Harrison Mooney is with uh, Puck Daddy on Yahoo Sports, also with the uh, Vancouver Suns Pass It to Bullis blog. That's right. And a man who wears many hats. I do. No, I'm just, I'm all over the place. I'm doing many things. I'm really less of like a hockey writer than I am just a local personality who drifts into your life. Local. He's a national, international personality. International personality. North American personality. So Professionally how you, ridiculous. How do you guys know each other? Well, through hockey. Yeah, through think, hockey. Yeah. Yeah. The same way that you and I know each other, basically. Right. Through hockey. Yeah, it was, I think it was... J- it was Jimmy Murphy, I think, introduced you and me. Right. Back in the day. Yes. And, and Twitter uh, it brings us all Twitter together. Twitter brings us all together. And I, again, I remember hanging out with you, I think it was All-Star Weekend in Montreal, insanely cold in yes. 2009. Sounds about right. And this is actually the first time I've ever met you in real life. That's no, true. It's exciting. We had, like, on-air chemistry, though. I feel like we know each other pretty well. well thank you. That's very oh, kind. I, I mean, you know, <laughs> coming from you, I, that, that feels pretty great. That's it, why it's, I asked you to marry me right yeah. i saw the sign you don't have to beautiful. respond now you did it open up it. your eyes yeah it really <laughs> 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 you think about it overnight thank you no, yeah no, i'm really glad i got that in there uh so we're live at chickies and pete's in uh south philadelphia not far from the rink the uh, wells fargo center where the philadelphia flyers play their home games a uh, carpeted over though uh, did, uh, were you allowed on the draft floor i wasn't allowed on the floor i was in the back of the floor in the rafters did anyone did anyone bark at you for getting near the floor at any time that happened to me at one point i, I had no designs on going you on the know, floor <laughs> get, no you're not no you're not allowed on the floor like okay thanks i just wanted to go to my little corner and, right yeah they were told to protect that space at all costs and there was like seven people many right. of them elderly which was great yeah um but yeah anyway no, i'm always <laughs> kind of amazed board. that they even let me come to these events so the last thing i'm going to do is like hop a fence or, you know, cause some kind of general mayhem I accidentally ruckus. wound up in the NHL club, like the team employee lounge. Did, so what goes on in there? Because I, I saw kids running out of there with candy, like, the whole time. Basically, what goes on in there are very nice bathrooms, tasty cakes, candies, cookies, water, soda, alcohol. Everything you could want, it's there. Right. So. It sounds like heaven. Yeah, it was. I mean, look, they treated us pretty well. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy. They did look. A, in, in all honesty, they did a very, very good job here this and, weekend. I really think so. And really, I mean, the city of Philly has been a star, man. The, the, the weather has been amazing. It's actually been, like, too hot. But I can take it. I can handle it. It could be worse. I, yeah, as, as, as a person of Irish, Scottish descent, the sun, it's like it's a really difficult thing for me. I can't. After, like, four minutes, i got to call it quits. <laughs> as, as many listeners, right? We're on, like, TV now for the first time. So any listener who's watching, yeah, like, this wow, is weird. that's what he looks like? You know, because people, whenever they meet me and they've never seen a picture of me, they're like, whoa, that's not what I thought you were going to look like <laughs> at all. Like, they think I'm 50 years old. It's, it's really weird. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's talk about the teams. Let's talk about the Philadelphia Flyers for starters. First of all, Flyers fans. And the, the boo job, I know this is Gary Bettman's radio channel, and we're not trying to be disrespectful or anything, but, man, they gave him a hard but, time. And, here's the, and the opposite of that is that they also cheered for every draft pick. And I've been to a number of these drafts now, Connor, and that was the loudest I've ever heard any crowd. It was pretty impressive, i got to yeah, tell you. They, did they really cheer for everything? Yes, they, they did. Nah, they, 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 booed, absolutely they booed did. everybody. They cheered for Flyers no, they picks cheered, and they Rod cheered, Brindamore. They cheered for the picks themselves. They booed every team. But right. when everybody's name, every draftee's name was called, they actually cheered very loudly last night. They I don't know. I don't Absolutely know. I mean, I just feel like you can't you can't say that they cheered for everybody when they no, they, they shouted every, sucks no, after no, no. every team during roll They call. did. They shouted sucks after every every team. Yeah. I'm not going to deny that. But when the players themselves, when it came to the young guys who were getting drafted, they cheered all of those guys as they went up on stage. And I think you know Philadelphia gets a bad rap. And yes, they booed Gary Bettman very loudly. And yes, every other team besides the Flyers and I guess the Hurricanes, because the Brindamore sucked, they did a really, really good job. I think it was very classy. They did boo Bettman like the best. They it really did. It was the did. best round of boos. And I, I do feel like Bettman is less of like a human man than like a robot who feeds on booze. Yeah. And so <laughs> like, I, he's probably going to like unleash a torrent of doomsday. Uh, now that he's kind of gotten his quotient. Again, this is his radio station. No, no, we're say. just kidding, Gary. And if <laughs> I we will love say. Gary. He's he's a, he, he loves the show. He yeah. did a very, yeah. very good job of powering through those boos on Friday night, man. He did not give up. He could have just stopped and walked off, and he continued on. Hey, he, he's good in that situation. Yeah. He I had mean, a joke prepared. Yeah, he did. right? He wrote that joke. Well, that was what you said. You said you have to believe he has a one-liner no, for every city. Absolutely. He's got this great list. He's like, oh, where's the draft today? And then he checks, and he's like, all right. And then he like pulls city that joke love. out of his drawer. It was great. Yeah. 
Yeah. It, it, yeah. Overall, I got to say, the first round and, and uh, broadcasting, I was hosting a broadcast of it for the first time. That was hard. It was really to figure out the timing and how everything was going and, and what, what team was going to take uh, no time at all and just go right to the mic. It, it seemed to me that less teams than usual congratulated the LA Kings on winning the Stanley Cup. Yeah. I think, I think it was you, five teams. You blame the Buffalo Sabres for that because they had the second pick, yeah. and they were so excited that like nobody traded up for that first pick and took Sam Reinhardt from them yeah. that Tim Murray like sprinted across the stage. <laughs> he didn't and have made any pick, time right? for anything else. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. he was kind of like the Buffalo Sabres look for Reinhardt, <laughs> and he was just off the stage. It was so fast. Yeah. It was amazing. But as soon as that happens, then you've kind of set the tone, and people are like, oh, we don't have to thank the Kings. It's great. We don't like them anyway. And then they just all went along and. So, how did the Canucks do this weekend, uh, if, if we're looking back? Uh, this was a weird week. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't think that a lot of people really like their moves, um, uh, the drafts anyway. I think you know, people are happy to be rid of Ryan Kessler. Now that he's gone, I think we can all agree that he was a, a difficult individual. That's the nice way of putting that. Um, you know, I think the Jason Garrison trade was smart. Uh, you get out from under a contract that was only good for one year, really. Uh, the Lyndon Vay trade today was great. But as far as their draft picks, I mean, they got a guy, Kyle Pettit. He had 10 points for the Erie Otters this year. And I, if you can only put up 10 points for the Erie Otters, I don't know why you're you you're, 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 well, you're, you're, you're not NHL bound if you can only contribute 10 yeah. points to the Erie Otters. Uh, it looks at times like they maybe just sorted all the prospects by size and then drafted that way. Right. Um, but the trades they made, I think, were really good. So, I mean, we must then talk about the Ryan Kessler trade. The reaction for an outsider is just to say, well, I mean, they got, they got punked by Ryan Kessler, and under the circumstances, what they got is not that bad. I mean, you give, a guy gives a list of two teams he's willing to get dealt to, uh, you're in a really tough spot. So the, yeah. the, the Anaheim Ducks, that's one that might come back and bite the Canucks in the rear, although I don't think they have designs on winning a Stanley Cup anytime soon. No, they're in the middle of a rebuild. And so, you know. But are they? I mean, you've still got the Sedins there. You've, you've got a guy like Alex Edler had a bad year last year, but is a good player. Right. And I mean, they've got some good veteran guys there. We'll call it a baby rebuild, okay. then, like a soft rebuild. I think they're hoping that the team could be a playoff team next year, but they're not banking on it. You know, the, the Ryan Kessler trade, They I think they knew. You know, you trade Ryan Kessler, you're not going to be better. You're not going to get a player that's going to be better as your second-line center. And you're really only as strong as your center depth in the NHL right now anyway. But, uh, you know, they got some good pieces back. Nick Bonino actually outscored Kessler last year. Uh, I mean, granted, that was in Anaheim, and the Ducks score goals, and the Canucks were basically committed not to scoring goals. True. But, uh, you know, I do think that they think that they can contend. They got worse, though. I mean, I don't think anybody can say that the Canucks got better this week. Right, and and that's okay. It's it's a Connor McDavid year. Is are, are they are they that bad? Is, no. Does are you sure? Because no, they're not that bad. Question marks and goal. You think Eddie Lack? I mean, do you know that Eddie Lack can be a number one no, over the course of an eighty-two game season? They're not confident about that either. You know, there's the rumors that they're chasing Ryan Miller. Clearly, they, they don't think Eddie Lack is the guy. Uh, I think they're kind of hoping for more of a platoon situation, and they don't trust Jakob Markstrom to be the other side of that platoon. So, you know, they're going to chase Miller, but. Uh, you know, I do think that they have enough in goal. I think they have a lot of good forwards. Uh, their defense core is still good. They're not a top-tier contender. They're not going to topple the Kings or the Blackhawks, but the Canucks, are, they're going to be okay. We're on uh, Hockey Primetime. That is the name of this radio show. My name is Connor McKenna. We're live from Chickies and Pete's in downtown Philly. We've got uh, fans making signs in the background, and we're having a good time here. The Philadelphia Flyers, Sarah, it's, I felt like, oh, man, it's the Flyers. They're so bold. No matter who the general manager is, they're so bold. They're willing to do bold and exciting things with uh, with their players, and the results have been mixed in the last couple of years. The bold move happened before the draft this week. The bold move week. happened before the draft, and if you listen to everything that the new general manager, Ron Hextall, said, you had to believe that unless they were able to get that number one pick, which was a long shot, that nothing big was going to go down, and that's exactly what you saw. You saw a draft, in fact, in my opinion, that looked a lot like last year's. They picked a player who's on the upswing, a guy who most other people had lower on their lists than they, and then he ended up going. But uh, to listen to the guys talk today, they're very, very happy with what they came away with. So is are the Flyers now a better team than they were, say, a week ago? Well, here's the issue. The Flyers have, for years now, since Chris Pronger went down, really needed a solid defenseman. And the Flyers are the only team in the NHL that doesn't have currently playing for them a defenseman that they drafted, that they nurtured, that they watched develop in their organization. 
the MO of the Flyers over the past you know, eight years, uh, over Holmgren's tenure, has been to identify guys in other teams and do what's needed to be done to bring them into the organization. So what the Flyers are doing now is stockpiling these talented, interesting defensemen and hoping that at least one of them catches. Right. And if you look at the past three years, they've drafted 11 D-men. That's a far cry from what they've done in the drafts before that when they really focused on centermen, wingers. It's, it's going to be interesting to see if any of these guys becomes the real deal. Earlier today, I ducked out of the draft when it was when it was over when all my stuff was over because I wanted to see the end of the soccer game I couldn't figure out if there was somewhere in the rink that I could watch it and I just said whatever let's go I went over to that gigantic Xfinity live right you yes didn't have to say it live on the radio <laughs> but you did and so this that place is crazy first of all uh, but it, it's like have you been to this place There's, I have yeah we, we, were, just, we, we just were there, there. Do? Yeah. yeah so it's yeah. like 10 different sports bars in one place with that gigantic huge screen yeah uh, but th there's a guy sitting next to me. We strike up a conversation. He's saying to me, so what about this guy, Subban? I hear the uh, the Philadelphia Flyers are, are going to be uh, working on an offer sheet. Uh, what can you tell me? Is that kid Subban really? coming to Philadelphia? Oh, man. You and know. <laughs> I mean, look, if Here's ever there the was situation. a time. If ever there was the time, yes. And you'd be crazy if you didn't want that guy on your team. He's got everything that they need. He's one of the best young players in the league. He's an exciting guy. He's fast. He works both sides of the ice so well. But the Flyers, at a cap of $69 million next year, they have to worry about making sure that they have enough players that they can dress on opening day right, right now before they go offer and give an offer sheet to anybody else. And so before you're even thinking about sending an offer sheet to P.K. Subban or any of those guys, you have to move some space under your cap, whether that's Vinny LeCavalier or somewhere else. You, that needs to be their focus right now above and beyond anything else. You appear to be suggesting that the Flyers are a prudent team that plans. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I mean, I've, I don't want, I'm not as close to the team as you are, but I, I, that's not what I've seen. Maybe well, the Ron Hextall are, era. The Ron Hextall era is a new era, and I believe what he says. You know, some GMs, some, some front office guys, you can take at face value, and others you sort of know they're giving you a line. And thus far, I really do believe Ron Hextall and the things he says. And so far, since he's taken over, he's done exactly what he's claimed that he wanted to do. Can you, can you answer me a question about the Scott Hartnell I trade? Can, I can try. Okay. So was that basically like, you know, when you're like your first day in prison and you slug the biggest guy? <laughs> Is that what that was? <laughs> You know, we're like in Breaking Bad where Gus Fring like cuts the guy, you know, you just know, a show. It, it, it was a big deal because in a lot of ways, even Claude Giroux said that Scott Hartnell was the face of the Flyers. Think about that for a second. That's yeah. the captain of the Flyers saying, the I'm not the, the face Flyers of the Flyers. Saying, yeah. The guy you just treated is the face of the Flyers. But I do in a lot of ways understand, and again, taking, taking Hextall at face value, he wants the Flyers to be faster up front. There's no room for, for a guy like Hartnell on your top line if you need to get faster. And so, yeah, nobody is going to say that an Umberger is the superior player. But in the long run, Umberger's contract is shorter. He's not going to be a top line guy. He's going to plunk right in on that third line, take the spot that Steve Downey leaves vacant. It does make sense. What about just the risk, though, of alienating your franchise player in, in Claude Giroux? I mean, that was, that was the other thing. It was like, well, this seems like kind of a not a fair trade and... Claude Giroux is clearly and publicly unhappy about it. You know, I think they, I think at a base level, they all understand it's a sport, it's a business. And yeah, it, it's Claude Giroux's friend. He, you know, this is a guy who was, again, the face of the Flyers, but they understand in the long run. I, I really don't think that it's a thing that's going to affect him going forward. I think he understands how this, how this stuff goes. So was the happiest moment uh, for Flyers fans yesterday? Was it uh, giving a, a round of applause to uh, Rod Brindamore? Was it welcoming Ron Hextall, uh, really uh, the first official welcome to the fold? Or was it when the Pittsburgh Penguins traded James Neal? I was going to say that or when they booed Rick Tockett at the yeah, Penguins as well. Was... That was a pretty intense moment, too. Yeah, I know. Yeah. A week ago, he was working with me at Comcast Sports, and now he's like <laughs> public enemy number one. Yeah. <laughs> how, how soon we forget. Right. Uh, anything else on the Vancouver Canucks? Right. There was one more thing I wanted to ask to both of you guys. I want to get a perspective. A Canadian, Harrison Mooney, based out of Vancouver. An American, Sarah Baker, based right here in Philadelphia. And uh, two young Phillies fans <laughs> behind us here. Yeah. All these guys saying they don't want to play in Canada. And, and I don't know if we're just hearing more about it now, but it seems to me more than ever before, time and time again, Jason Spezza, Ryan Kessler, player after player is coming out and saying, I don't want to play in Canada. Is this bigger now than it was before? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's you look at what happened this last year, you know, in the NHL, where the Canadian teams were just the worst teams. I mean, you look, the American teams were good, the Canadian teams were bad. It was that simple. 
Um, you know, and I think that when you have these teams that are struggling to, to ice a good team, uh, and then on top of that, you've got all this media expectation. You know, the fans are on you all the time to be better. Uh, I think it's just kind of a pain. It's like, you know, if I'm going to endure this difficult fan base, I'd like to endure it for a winning franchise. And right now, that's not what you're getting. And so you're seeing guys like Kessler and like Spezza, you know, opting out to cities where it's maybe a little quieter and the team's a little better. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Well, I think that's what he's just keyed in on, is a lot of these sort of smaller market American teams are finding success. I mean, a handful of years ago, nobody would want to play in L.A. because L.A. wasn't a winning team. You didn't have the fan base and you didn't have a winning culture. And now you have both of those things and you don't have the pressure that you have north of the border. So in a lot of ways, it really does make sense. And the teams are terrible. Six <laughs> of the seven Canadian teams were absolutely terrible last year. It's a fair point. They, it has, they haven't been that bad for a long time. Uh, Sarah Baker, Harrison Mooney, you're good people. I uh, really do appreciate you coming by here and uh, enjoying some crab fries and making some time for me. Thanks uh, for having us. Thanks. That's Harrison Mooney. That's Sarah Baker. I'm Connor McKenna. This is Hockey Primetime on NHL Network Radio with you until 7 o'clock Eastern time tonight, 6 o'clock Central, 5 o'clock Mountain, and 4 o'clock Pacific, right? Something like that. That's close pretty much it's right. It's close enough. 7.30 in Newfoundland. <laughs> Stay tuned. Uh, Sean McAndrew is uh, Down Goes Brown. He's also an excellent hockey writer for Grantland. He'll be joining us on the other side when Hockey Prime Time continues live from home of the $2 beers. Coors Light, 2 bucks. Come on down to Chickies and Pete's.